And that poses a challenge to conventional political parties, obviously, knocked sideways by these fast-growing new movements. But it's also a challenge to the media and to what might be called experts of all kinds, struggling to hold this new breed of politician to account at a time when public trust in us is very low. And for business, it creates incredibly unpredictable operating environments. Conventional governments usually, if not always, respond to arguments that their proposals will slow economic growth or stifle wealth creation. But populist movements are different. Banks got a taste of that after the crash. We've seen it with Trump confronting Ford and General Motors over the location of their factories. And if I had to bet on the next industry to find itself in a less benign climate than it's used to, I would say tech. So there's lots to discuss, and thankfully, a panel with truly global reach to discuss it tonight, because understanding what's really going on under the bonnet here requires a global overview. So from your left, Marie Harris is an expert on public opinion in South Africa and director at Ipsos Public Affairs. Clifford Young is president of Ipsos US, but is going to give us both a US perspective and something of a global overview. Uh, from Italy, we're joined by Nando Pagnoncelli, media commentator, presidential advisor, and president of Ipsos Italy, a man I'm told so celebrated in his home country that he gets practically mobbed walking down the street. <laughs> I'm true. not sure this happens yet to Britain's own Ben Page, no, CEO no, of Ipsos no, Mare no. UK and I, but perhaps after tonight. Uh, we're also joined by Henri Wallau, uh, Global Chair of Ipsos Public Affairs, joining us from France, which is obviously in the middle of a particularly fascinating election campaign. And last but not least, uh, we're joined by Canada's favourite pollster, Daryl Bricker, Global CEO of Ipsos Mori Public Affairs and author of bestseller, The Big Shift, The Seismic Change in Canadian Politics, Business and Culture. So I'm going to ask each of them for some introductory remarks, and then we should have lots of time for questions. So please don't be shy. You don't often get this kind of concentration of polling expertise in one room, so take advantage. For those of you who'd like to tweet, the hashtag is Ipsos Mori Live. Uh, and if you want the Wi-Fi code, we have had some requests. You're looking for the iMesh Wi-Fi, e I-M-E-C-H-E, -E, and the code is George, as in Prince, 1847. Thanks very much. And without further ado, I'm going to ask Cliff to kick us off. Thank you very much. Awesome. Just as he's pouring his water. Pouring my what? Water. What? <laughs> Foxed you with my British accent. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I speak American English sometimes. Um, well, thank you, everyone, and, and uh, it's really exciting. Yeah. Exciting times. Brave new world, maybe. Um, going through lots now, obviously. Uh, lots of uncertainty. And what I'll do very quickly, I'm going to give a 30,000-foot view. Um, our point of view, generally speaking, what we're going to find after that is a lot of the talks will show the nuance across countries. Then I'm going to dive deep, quickly into the U.S. election, the drivers of Trump, understanding populism and those factors that brought him to power. And then I'm going to step back again and see to what extent those same forces can be seen around the world. So very quickly, this is us. I'll skip that. That's me. And I'll start off just sort of with the central point thesis point of view that we indeed are entering into what we're calling a new political super cycle. Okay, and how do we define that? You know, for, for decades, actually, we always thought of the Western industrialized world as being certain, stable, predictable. When we th thought about developing countries, maybe Southern Europe to a certain extent, we thought about instability, uncertainty. Our basic thesis is politics in general is increasingly less certain, and we can think of that on the electoral side, we can think that of that in the policy side. What we do know, we have a database of 600 elections plus elections around the world. About 85% of all elections historically have been slam dunks, fairly easy to predict, more of the same or throw the bums out. There are 15% of elections in our database that are what we call disruptive elections, where anti-establishment candidates have a special premium uh, where, where oppositional politics against the system have a greater weight. Um, we actually think that we're entering into a cycle where disruptive politics, and more specifically disruptive elections, will become more the norm. So how do we define disruptive elections, disruptive politics? What's the characteristic of a society of election that's disruptive? What we know basically Typically, there's a widespread belief that the system is broken, 
that parties and politicians no longer care about the common person, that a strong leader has to take back the country, where confidence in institutions is very low. Does that sound familiar? Indeed, I cut my teeth in polling in Latin America. I was in Latin America for 11 years, in Brazil for 11 years, polled on Chavez, the rise of, of Chavez, on Evo Morales, and in many different countries. These were the sorts of things we talked about in Latin America in, in, in the late 90s and the mid noughts This is what we're seeing here. A couple data points. It's incredible. This is a global poll. Like, soak this data in. 57% of global citizens in 24 countries believe that their society is broken. 57%. 68% believe that the economy is rigged against people like them, rigged in favor of rich people. So super majority belief across the board that the system is broken. Very, very telling data and really important drivers, and I'll come and talk specifically about the US uh, in terms of politics. So how did it play out in the US? There are basically, why did Trump come to power? Indeed, I'll tell you, last year, Two years ago even, no one could quite understand why he could say all these sort of egregious things, at least from one perspective, and still stay high in the polls, hovering the polls. In the US, there are basically two key drivers. One, again, is the belief that the system is broken. Super majority belief that it is. I just have a couple examples. Traditional parties and politicians don't care about people like me. And that, that's, that doesn't vary across parties. Indeed, we can actually even understand Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in the same vein, a widespread belief that the system is broken, first driver. The second driver, nativism, belief that there should be some sort of priority given to native born over foreign born. Just a couple examples, and this is very, we see the huge distinctions by party here, but for instance, more and more, I don't identify with what America has become. 72% of Republicans believe that, 45% of Democrats. So nativism on the one hand, is nativist rhetoric and widespread belief that the system is broken. One last point I want to make. Our system is broken items or questions were actually developed in Latin America in the knots to understand Hugo Chavez. And there's a certain logic there. And the logic is the following. I call it the Caudillo syndrome, the powerful uh, leader syndrome, which is basically, I believe that my country's rich, but there are so many poor people. Why are there so many poor people? because the system is rigged against people like me. Traditional parties and politicians no longer care about people like me. We need a strong leader to take back our country. Sounds similar? Indeed, this is something we studied ad nauseum, at length in Latin America, and we're seeing the same sort of manifestations um, in the United States and uh, the Western world. So nativism on the one hand, system is broken on the other. The point being is, in the US, this is a fancy analysis, Statistical analysis, I'll explain in a second. The point being is, this emergent belief system, nativism on the one hand, and the belief that the system broken on the other, is upending our party system in the US. Indeed, what we're seeing here is that the traditional drivers of, of party affiliation in the US, of politics in the US, I'm a Republican or a Democrat, were a function of two dimensions for over basically the last half century. Belief in big versus small government, being more or less socially conservative. Those were the key drivers. But what we see in this new Trumpian world is an emerging new dimension where, which really defines politics and outcomes, belief that the system is broken, and belief that immigrants are at fault for that, for that scenario, for that outcome. Very, very important and very, very important drivers. The question is, how, if these are the emerging drivers in the US, how do they play out globally speaking? We have a global, global survey here where we're looking at nativism by system is broken. We can kind of plot out the countries to see where they fall. Remember, very high levels across countries in terms of belief that the system is broken. But we do see that there is nuance and variability across countries. We have the traditional Latin American countries that aren't nativist but are very much predisposed to believing the system is broken. That's your very traditional economic populism that we've seen over the last three decades. We see actually that the United States and some other English-speaking countries are lower on the belief that this, the system is broken, but are really predisposed towards hearing nativist messages and believing nativist uh, beliefs. And then we have countries that are sort of high on both, France, Italy, um, Hungary, Spain as examples. So we can see just from here, and we'll hear with, with the other speakers, that there is nuance to these drivers and there is variability. 
Ultimately, the question is, to what extent are these emergent drivers, nativism on the one hand and the system is broken on the other, important for defining political outcomes? And what I have here is what I would call relevant importance. Think of these as percentages. And think of these conceptually. I won't go into the details technically. But conceptually, how important for politics in that given country are these two emergent dimensions? On the one hand, nativism, and the other hand, uh, the system is broken. And what do we see? Overall, about a third of politics can be explained by these emergent dimensions. And some countries are very high on that scale. We see the US, uh, it's 45%. And in France, for instance, 50%. So these emergent dimensions, we can call them populist dimensions, we can call them something else. These emergent dimensions are super important for understanding politics in the US, the outcome which is Trump. But these emergent dimensions also are very important for defining political outcomes across countries. And I'll leave it at that. That's my talk. Thank you.